Okay, let's talk about kink. So I had my friend Melissa on the show yesterday. Who do you know, Melissa? She's a sort of Berlin scene, yes. kink scene. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's an old friend. So she was on talking about kink. We always have a good time. And um, let in case people miss that one, you know, what is kink and why is it not just a sign of pathology? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a big question. What is kink? Kink is, again, it's pretty much everything outside of what's perceived normal. It's like what is not standard routine in bed. Everything outside of that could be kink. You know, it can be fantasies, can be kinky. Uh, using gloves, like these rough gloves or soft gloves to touch someone can be kinky. Having sex outside or in your car could be kinky, it can be anything. Having it's monogamous not... sex in a missionary position with the lights off, that's Yeah, it's pretty much the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the kinkiest thing you've ever done that you're willing to admit oh my God, to? Really? On a public, it's a public podcast, this is recorded, yeah. your mum might see it, your children my are gonna see it. My kids might listen to us when they grow so up. Given that, what is the kinkiest thing you're willing, and I'm not gonna admit anything, just for the record. So um, what, what, are you, what are you willing to admit to? Is there any particular fun ones? There is there's a whole list, so I have to think. I have to think about which one I would want to share. Which but one I you want to share? One, I remember. We're going to edit it out. Don't email me afterwards asking to edit out. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I remember one of the, one one very uh, kinky thing I once did was uh, uh, being sexy in a sauna. You know, these steam cabins they cannot film anything because of the steam. And I was I was having a little bit of fun with my lover and his slave. And uh, if you love and his slave. Yes, yes. Got it. Yes. Got it. Okay. We were, having, we were just having that, like everyone's got a slave. That's just we, normal. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we had a bit of sexy interaction going on, and then suddenly two people came into that steam cabin, and we were like, "Oh, nothing happened." And they were like, "Yeah, there was, but please continue." And we were like, "Okay." <laughs> so they just had their sauna while your three are going for it. Sorry. They just continued. Was this in the Netherlands? Oh yeah, in a regular sauna. Oh. Excellent. So that was that was fun. You know, and another thing that might be probably very kinky is just you know when I when I one of the things I do for a living is have play parties. I'll dress up in my own sexy attire. You want to say what a play party is because not everyone would know that. Uh, play, yes, of course. A play party is like kind of like a guided space, like a space that's held. So there is someone having an overview, doing an introductory workshop and such. Um, and then you can do whatever you want within the space that's designed. So in my, my play parties are sexy, so people can have sex in them. They can, do, um, they, can, they can do tantric things, they can do kinky things, it's all fine. And then me and my team, we will also dress up in our kinky things, whatever that looks like. And then I'm there in my, my, my fetish clothes, just looking at everything and just watching it and just standing there dancing in the middle and seeing people sex do party. sexy things <laughs> to me that is very kinky and i love it <laughs> awesome why as embodiment you know embodiment podcast right like why might we be interested in king i mean you know because one one thing i don't think there's too many conservatives listening saying oh you're sick and weird i think a lot of people might be listening there and saying okay cool that's your business you're uh -huh. into sort of sex that's cool you know, Mark's into dolphins, great, whatever, you know, that's your business, you know, as long as the dolphin's consenting, it's all good. And, like, I think that's kind of a pretty normal view amongst my liberal friends, but it might be, like, too much information, we don't know, but why might embodiment people be interested in this topic? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, to, I, can, I can tell you what it brought me in terms of embodiment is that, um, again, I used to be very shy, I was not a person taking a lead, and, you know, people can tell you how to do that, uh, like step in front of groups, go practice speaking, uh, do this, do that, tell people what to do, you know, in a consensual way. But when people tell me that I don't feel it in my body and my belief is mm -hmm. that I need to do it and feel it in my body before it really reprograms my brain. Correct. And in King, one of the profound, most profound things for me, and I've seen happen a lot with, with other people is that that moment that someone put me in this dominant leading role over someone, um, I was stepping into this, we can call it this archetype or this inner, mm -hmm. you know, tapping into this part where I can actually be that, or you can even call it role play. When I step into that role of leading someone and I actually become that person, then I get this embodied imprint of like, okay, mm -hmm. this is what it's like to take lead. And you know right. what? It's not that scary. It wasn't for a few seconds, but it's not, and it was so much fun. And then I started to feel the fun in leading. Uh, and also unconsciously letting someone else lead. And it, 
it changed everything. It sexual. I mean, I, I, get, I mean, basically, you just made a very good argument for why embodiment is important. I think it's a very eloquent, concise argument for why embodiment. We have to step into things physically, not just read the books on them. Oh, yeah. You know, but you could step into the role of a military general or an airplane pilot. Just as why make that sexual? What, what, is that, what does that add to it? Oh, I just want to say a kink is not necessarily sexual. Like most of the, the best kink scenes I've done are not necessarily sexual. So I can keep my clothes on and have a very kinky sexy se session with someone. So it doesn't have to be sexual. Um, many paths lead to Rome, you know, I just happen to love the kinky one. So uh, uh, if, if your path is that one of that general and it works for you, then, then great. And uh, I just fun, happen right? to prefer this one. It can make deep personal growth work fun. I mean, if someone said to me, you know, hey, you want to learn, you know, to submissive role, you know, do you want to do that, you know, with a hot girl in leather or do you want to do that in, an, in a boring way? I'd go, I'm going to go for option A. Like that, that is a more interesting way to learn anything, surely. I mean, it's, it's motivating, it's interesting, it's engaging, if nothing else. Yeah, there's so much pleasure in it. There's so much fun in it. There's so much fun in spanking someone's butt and making that consensual, joyful experience. And other than that, like even with this, the, the, the spanking example, um, there, it's all, also a beautiful modality to heal trauma. So there's- Yeah, I was gonna ask about that, there's sort of potential for both trauma healing and trauma uh, sort of, um, what would be the word, um, reenactment. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Let's say a yeah. bit more about the relationship between kink and trauma. Well, we many of us have, pretty much everyone has experiences in their life where their power was taken away uh, or when someone was overpowering in, in them in a non-consensual way. And what you can do with kink is, is kind of like you say, like reenacted, but then consensually and maybe with a different outcome. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe you, have, you have trauma where someone like overpowered you physically and you reenacted in a way where you, uh, you know, throw them off of you. Or where Paul you Linden's are the one. Trauma work is explicitly that. I mean, that's Paul Linden's explicit trauma work around self-defense. He's a martial wow. arts teacher, and he will, you know, yeah. that's essentially what he does. Is he sets up situations where someone is being attacked, and then gives them a different outcome, and yeah. it's profoundly healing for people. But that doesn't necessarily yeah. organize in that way in a in a sort of kink scene, is it? Some sometimes it is. There are workshops and places where we actually set this up for people with each other, like really as a as a like the kink world. Like one of the stigma is that it's it's a violent world. Well, it's one of the most loving, if not the most loving. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely lovely people. Just really consent yeah. boundaries and sweet and yeah. just very. Pleasant. My experience, a lot, of, just, a lot of consent work that's now uh, touching the bigger audience comes right. From kink came first, right? I, I came across kink and I was like, "Wow, this is so much better than yoga. Yoga is really abusive." You know? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We need to spank each other a bit more. So, yeah. Yeah. But also in other ways, for example, um, if you have been humiliated or uh, verbally abused, you could set that up where someone is actually saying those things to you and you just hear them again and again and again until the charge is completely gone. And you can release it. You can release it. Sometimes it helps when it's stuck, you know, when it's in a part of your brain that you cannot access. Uh, I've had sessions where I was dominating a person and just spanking them while saying something to them so that they could break through these walls that are like keeping them away from healing. Like the trauma would have such a wall around it that you would like literally have to um, consensually use impact to, to get through to that. And then That's they can true. release the emotion and now they're just dying inside and writing angry letters. And I mean, it's potentially quite delicate work you're talking about here, huh? It's super delicate work because as, as when you are dominating someone who's going into this emotional processes, you have to be so precise, like knowing when to stop your hand in the air and to take it back and breathe and then guide them into like letting go of these old emotions that are still stored in the system. And often it, it, it such scenes and often in an emotional release of anger and sadness. And then at the end, it's like people shed a load of, of weight. You know, all this weight that they carried with them, they can like finally release it. What yeah. do you think is the relationship between how people are in the rest of life and their kink? So, you know, there's these stereotypes like, you know, the submissive secretary who becomes the dominatrix or the <laughs> dominant businessman who becomes, wants to be dressed up as a little baby, you know, and I, I've seen a little bit of that in myself, but as I've become more sort of powerful and successful, I've sort of seen the other side of things as a bit more attractive because it's just like, oh, I just want to, turn off 
and that was not no. normally my mode you know i don't reveal too much here but it's like it's been like okay like now i see both sides as having a place you know yeah. and it's um I, I, what what's your take is it compensatory because i've also had sexual partners who were just exactly like they were in real life in bed there was yeah. no compensation no balancing it was just they were them but maybe more so you know and then that's kind of like i would guess like most of the dominant guys i know are kind of probably a bit dominant in life generally you know high testosterone high achievement kind of people so what do you sense is the correlation because you've probably got a bit of some bigger sample size than i have yeah, well, it's pretty much like you say, like there, there, there's the people who are in a similar flavor all the time and there's people who compensate. It's, 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 it's exactly as you say. Sometimes they switch, sometimes they, they don't. And, and there are more submissive people than true dominant people in the world. There's there are more submissive, submissive people. people. Yeah, there's more submissive people. If you take a general population, like the real, like real authentic, more people are submissive than there are dominant. Why is that? I don't know. I, well, I do know actually. There is, it's you know, as 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 a society, you don't need that many leaders. You just need a few. You need a few good leaders, and you need a whole lot of people who can follow that leaders in in different yep. ways to have a functioning yeah, yeah. society. And it's the same, you know, like the real authentic dominate dominating people dominance. Uh, there's there's fewer of them. Mm. And then I'm and not meaning the ones who abuse their power or who like act sure, sure, in something sure, that sure. which is not authentic. Yeah, and what you know, I've got I've I've had partners in the past who were kind of guilty about being submissive. They were like, you know, I'm a modern feminist Dutch woman, you know, yeah. I shouldn't be submissive, and you know, like they, they had a narrative that like, and when they let that go, they just enjoyed themselves so much more. Yeah, and others who just won't ever let it go. I've come across because it's just yeah. it feels like politically guilty or something for them. Uh, and I've I've also met kind of new age hippie guys who also weren't able to accept their like dominance as well. But it's like generally, depending on the culture, subculture, you know, like conventional people, it's going to be men one way, women the other. Then that's flipped for less conventional people, less conventional subcultures. Do you come across people who have that like guilt of their sexual well, type? Yeah. <laughs> a lot and it's one of the things i'm passionate about is to support people to let that shame go but you know honestly looking from more general perspective of society there is no place on the kink spectrum that's accepted and not taboo you know dominant men are perpetrators submissive men are sissies dominant women are bitches and ruling i don't know what and and submissive women are no no feminist you know you know there's there is no positive place on that uh, area at the moment you know there's a lot of taboo on any culture, though, right i mean the netherlands is not england and hippie communities it changes i mean, oh, I mean yeah, just i get yeah. grief as a dominant man just dominant in my manner i get more grief in a buddhist center than i ever will do in a business right <laughs> just <laughs> like there's a context there of course yeah of course this was very much generalizing of course yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. cool what else are you passionate about about in this topic like why is this your thing what is the thing you go, you know, want the whole world to know this? What I want, well, what important is to me is, is to, we don't get to practice touch and consent in a, in a normal world. I wish we did. Like we learn in school, we learn how to, when it comes to sex, we learn how to not get pregnant, how to not get sick. Right? That's right, right, right. That's the focus. Yeah. Don't get a disease, don't get pregnant. And this is the biology yeah. of it. Nobody name. tells you it can be fun. Nobody tells you it's okay. Nobody tells you it's a need to have intimacy. And intimacy to me is the full spectrum of, of being real with another person. So from, from eye gazing to touch to cuddling to sex and kink and everything. Like nobody's teaching us that. And what I'm super passionate about is that we all get the opportunity to feel in our bodies what it means when I want something, when I have a desire. And that I get an embodied sense of when it's a boundary of when I don't want something related to intimacy. So we need spaces where we can practice that. We need spaces where someone tells us, okay, you now stand in front of someone and feel what's happening now. If you come closer, what's happening then? If you go further away, what's happening then? And what does that mean for you? What are your signals? You know, I cannot tell you how your boundaries feel. I can tell you how mine feel. And by now I'm able to communicate them which which for a lot of people is super difficult i know it has been for me um so we need places we really need places not just places to touch each other i i do think we need them really we really really need them too and we need places where we can practice where we can practice intimacy 
or you can practice vocalizing yeah saying just saying yes to someone saying no to someone because how many of us haven't you know um violated our own boundaries just because we couldn't say no and if you've practiced that like 10 times 20 times 100 times it's so much easier when it really matters so, so it's like you need a dojo you need a place where you can practice where there's yeah. no consequences yeah. where there's control conditions and consenting partners who aren't going to abuse you right yeah like and some support some some people around you who are like neutral support if you need if mm. you need to to you know share about it or you know yeah mm. yeah I would so want to change that in the world. <laughs> cool. Yeah.